In this particular case, I'm in the drawing viewer. If we go to um, print drawing, that requires rendering. There's only one image here, so it's going to go do its thing, and it's going to render an image for us. Um, cool, we've done it here. Same thing with reports. So if I go to reports, and it's a single drawing report, and I do preview, it's going to generate the image client side, upload it to the server, and then let the report viewer know that the image is ready for it, and it can go do its thing. And quite frankly, the report viewer takes as much time as the plans rendering. So we have that squared away. Let's go to reports where the real bang for the buck comes in. So we're going to go to reporting. We'll go to reports. Uh, I'm going to select a simple drawing with image. I'm going to tell it I'm using floor plans. I'm going to tell it to theme by cost center. And I'm going to tell it I want uh, default space labels on here. We'll just pick everything. We'll tell it to do absolutely everything. And by mistake, on purpose, <laughs> I'm not going to filter anything. I actually only want to do this for one property, but I'm not going to filter anything, and I'm going to go to preview the report. And immediately a screen pops up and it says, hey, I'm going to start generating 34 images for you. In some cases, this could be 450. Geez, I made a mistake. I'm going to cancel. Done. I've just canceled the process. Images stopped generating. I'm not going to be sucking up processor time. The report's not going to come back, and I can go back and do what I actually wanted to do, which is come down to a specific location, and I'll pick two locations here, and then hit preview. And now I can see one of two images is actually being generated, and it tells me exactly what it's doing, exactly where we are in the process, um, and then it's telling me those images are done, and it's loading the report. Und voila, there's my report. So we're pretty happy with what client-side image generation is doing. So let's start right into the main course for today. So we want to talk about maintenance and how maintenance works in Evolve. And maintenance in Evolve can be deceptively simple, but there's an awful lot of horsepower behind the scenes. So by default, we out of the box I'm just I can create a service request for a work order in minutes after I have a ball up and running get my classifications down if I use them uh, configure my screens and away I go I can start re creating a service request for a work order day one with little to nothing other than hey I'm cold hey I'm hot hey whatever and then things are managed manually but we have a lot of horsepower under the hood so there's actually um, three levels of hierarchy, like there is with virtually every collection in Evolve. Uh, category and class are just upper level methods of saying, hey, I'm going to create work orders and uh, I want to create a demand work order and those demand work orders may have different classifications assigned to them and here's what the hierarchy looks like. So I have some demand work orders for electrical, too hot, too cold, um, others for boilers and whatever. So that's how my classifications work. But the real magic of what Evolve can do, if you configure it, has to do when I get to that bottom tier and select a job. What is a job? A job is, hey, this is the specific thing I'm trying to accomplish. I'm too hot, I'm too cold, the sink is leaking, the whatever. This is where we can start to add a lot more information and a lot more automation to what the application does. I'm going to expand this dialog just so we can see everything at one time here. <coughs> so we have a job number and a job name. We can set default priorities for it. We can assign it to specific trades. We can decide that it's going to that any one of these jobs that come in are going to be charged to a specific account. So if we're doing some level of accounting, we can make that happen. We can assign default tasks to a job. Hey, um, there is a drip coming from the steam, so steam pipe repair. One of the things we may want to do with steam pipe repair is we're going to put our asbestos uh, precautions in as tasks every time we go to do a steam pipe because the building's 100 years old. So we can 
create tasks that have steps and essentially assign those right to this so that when the work order is generated, those steps will be uh, on the work order. And we can also give it an estimated time so that we know what it should take um, and then we can measure what the actual time is against the estimated hours. And then there's two last buttons down here and there's way more to what happens with these last two buttons. One is automatically create a work order. So our paradigm is a request to do something comes in. Void of any other settings, it just sits in the request piece and somebody looks at what came in, assigns it, creates, ultimately that's turning it into a work order and away they go. Well, there may be certain things we automatically want to come in. So a leak might be something that, hey, I'm not going to wait for somebody to kind of catch this thing coming into a queue. If I have a plumbing leak, I want to automatically generate a work order. So I click the automatic the create a work order. So anytime a job comes in that says there's a leak, a work order is going to be automatically generated. The next step is, okay, well, what happens to that work order when it's automatically generated? Um, we have our notifications assigned with those things, so people could be appropriately notified. But we also have the ability to automatically assign it. And this is where there's some very cool stuff, and we're gonna, we need to walk through these settings. This assignment checkbox relies on a lot of other things being appropriately set up, but once they are, the automation behind the scenes is pretty significant. So in this case, we're just going to set up this task, what it is, an occupant move. We're going to automatically generate a work order and we're going to automatically assign it. Um, and what, what does automatic assignment mean, Bob? Well, let me try in the Queen's English, which I'm just not very good at showing you what that means. So remember we have trades. When a work order comes in, we know its location. I, if I go to labor and open up a labor record, on the labor tab, I have a bunch, uh, on the labor dialog, I have a bunch of tabs and information that I can include here. And this is where that automation magic comes in. So the first two tabs, or actually the first three tabs, are attributes associated with this particular person. But the, la the these two tabs, locations and trades, these tie right into the automation for the assignment of a work order to individuals. First of all, a work order comes in for a specific location. Geez, I want to add to this labor one or more locations, and it doesn't matter what they are. Um, so as you can see here, we, we're still working on our, our multiple tier stuff. So I'm going to add some locations to this person, labor time and life force, and then I'm going to add a trade to that person. So let's just add, and I forget what the heck it was. It was a move, move management. There we go. So now to this person, I've added locations and trades. What does this now mean for the automation part? So if you recall, on the job, we have said that it is assigned to this specific trade. We want a work order automatically generated, and we want to assign it. What that task does, the service request comes in. It says, oh, they want to automatically generate a work order. We generate the work order. Oh, we want to assign this. Here's the trade for this job. The job came in for this specific location. So let me go look at all of our labor that is assigned to move management, because that's the trade we associated with it, at this location and let me assign, if they're a supervisor, I believe that's the top assignment, and, and if not, it's everyone there else comes in. So it's going to try and do its best match. Hey, here is a person at that specific location signed to that trade, um, and they're a supervisor, they're the one that's gonna get the work order. Hey, I have a person who's assigned to move management, there are no supervisors at that location, but there are people for move management at a location assign that person, a one of those people, a work order. Hey, I don't have anyone at that trade, but I have people at that location. One of them happens to be a supervisor. I'm going to assign it 
to that person. So there's a lot, There's, I think there's four or five tiers of logic that comes into play trying to do the best possible match of locations, trades, and jobs to that work order to automatically assign it. So while there's a lot of complexity behind it, it's actually relatively easy for you to configure it. Create your labor records, assign them to specific, one or more trades, by the way, um, and that's one of the other criteria comes in. If I have a person at a location and their only trade is move management, they take priority over, I have a person at that location that does move management grounds and general maintenance, the person with just move management is going to be moved up higher in the priority of assignments than someone who has multiple trades. But you can assign multiple locations and multiple trades. So the key is take your labor, assign them locations, assign them trades, um, and then set your tasks, whatever they may be, and in your jobs, assign uh, the trades to the particular job, and all that automation happens on the back end. Questions? Hey, Bob. You said if yeah. um, a, um, if there's no nobody with the the uh, selected trade, it will go to a supervisor. That's correct. Is that hearing that? Yes, that's correct. So, so let's for take instance, a look. if you were doing move management and there was nobody in move management, it would just go to a supervisor in another field, another trade? That's correct. That's correct. Um, so to put it in more into perspective, there's, there's usually two, and I am oversimplifying this and I know this, <laughs> um, there's two general methods that this auto generation works in most facilities. In some facilities, they never want it. They never want a work order assigned to an individual. They want a work order. Hey, there's something that needs to be done. They want it to come to a supervisor, and the supervisor assigns that work order. So to do that, you simply select somebody as a supervisor, give them one or more trades, uh, or if it happens to be move management, just give them one, and that supervisor gets the notification. That supervisor can then assign it an individual. That's okay. one way that it traditionally happens. And then this, the second method is, hey, yeah, we want most of our stuff to work that way. So I'm going to assign a supervisor for one or more trades. Just think of an electrical shop, an HVAC shop, a general maintenance shop, very common kind of practices. I have a supervisor for each of those shops. In 90% of the cases, I want a work order assigned to the supervisor, so the supervisor can then actually assign labor to it. So I set up a supervisor for those shops. Uh, I can set up labor for those shops, but the supervisor takes priority. Okay. However, however, there can be some instances where it's not the supervisor that I want it to go to with somebody else. So either setting them up as a supervisor or setting them up as a single trade gives them, bumps them up in the priority list. What if there's uh, three people that are in HVAC and there's no supervisor? Is there any any logic to the selection between the three HVAC? Yeah, heads? and that's what I'm going to have to take a look at. It may, and, and I'm not saying yes, by the way. I will have to take a look at the logic. Make, let me make a note to, to kind of document for you um, the specific logic. Let's document specific assignment logic. I'm not sure if this is built in yet, um, but I would presume that thinking to, because this was something that's, this has been here for a while, so you'll forgive me if I don't remember every nuance and detail. I think once we get down to, hey, I have three people at that location, <coughs> each uh, three people at that location assigned to plumbing, and that's all they're assigned to is plumbing, uh, and none of them are supervisors. So from there, how do I um, then decide which one I'm going to assign it to by default? 
Um, I have to check this, but I would assume, and then my assumptions may be correct, it may be the person with the least open work orders at that moment in time. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you have a, a planner uh, for a shop, you just set them up as a supervisor? Exactly. 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 Yeah, we, we, we've come across situations where you have multiple shops, but it is the maintenance office, for the lack of a better term, that even decides what shop something may go to. Right. Um, right. You know, when I was doing the task, that's what happened. It would come, our work request would come into Sally, and Sally would decide what supervisor may get it, or in some cases, what individual may get it. Um, so Sally was set up as they, there was. Sally was the only one things got automatically assigned to, and then Sally would get a notification, or she actually had it up on her screen at all at all times, and would see something come in. She'd hear a little ping in her email that something came in. She'd go right to the list and say, "All right, I'm going to assign this one to either a supervisor or an individual." So there's lots of ways to kind of configure this uh, depending on the specific needs of an organization. Great. Thank you. You're welcome.